Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight, uh, participating in an event that is actually very close to my heart. Um, having worked many years in uh, European diplomacy and development issues, I've been inspired by the writings of the traveling of Kapuczynski and his um, approach to development. The European Union has more than half a century experience and engagement in development efforts, in development policies and in development assistance. Following Kapuczynski's uh, motto, to judge something, you have to be there, the European Union is present in more than 140 countries around the world. We've been working hard together with partners like South Africa to assist countries attaining the Millennium Development Goals the eight goals adopted by all the UN member states and international organizations back in 2000 to end poverty. Each goal has specific target and timelines. But as Kapuczynski said in an interview to the press magazine once, we know everything about the global problem of poverty. What we can't figure out is how to reduce it in practical terms. We won't be able to fully achieve the set targets of the eight MDGs by 2015 as envisaged. So we have important work ahead for the next year, for 2015. Together, we need to draw on past experiences on what worked well, what has worked less well, and come up with post-2015 ideas to improve our fight against poverty and to end poverty in our world. Hence the decision of the European Union to nominate 2015 the International Year for Development. With this we want to raise awareness among EU citizens and elsewhere around the world of um, to encourage debate like today's one and to act as a catalyst for policy development. This is why we are here today. The European Union together with UN UNDP and partner universities established the Kapuczynski Development Lectures. Over 15 Kapuczynski Lectures took place since 2009 and in 2015 at home in the EU member states, 28 member states, we are also holding in each country a Kapuczynski Development lesson, um, Lecture. See this as a contribution to a development debate that we want to be creative, allow to think out of the box, and spark further interest in finding solutions. So it's indeed a pleasure to be here, as I said, and to welcome Mr. Aron Marevi and his lecture on challenges of urbanization. So we are live streaming this event, so um, I've been told to encourage you all to participate in the debate. Uh, and to follow us on Twitter um, with hashtag KDL. of UNDP, I'd like to thank the, the European Commission and the uh, House University, University of Cape Town, and particularly Aroma Revi for accepting this uh, invitation. Uh, thank you all for, for coming here. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. So far we did uh, most of the lectures in, in Europe. This is actually the first lecture in, uh, in Africa, and I think as uh, in the, in the writings and, and, and books of Kapuscinski, which was mentioned by, by Gordon, uh, before um, he really was um, uh, was uh, uh, bringing um, to us Europeans uh, Africa much closer, and he was uh, I think he was convinced that the world begins here. Uh, actually, as as we can see at the beautiful Cape Point uh, and other places, um, and. Um, I think that this is this is also important that uh, and and also interesting for us that you uh, have I understand very relevant um, uh, speaker here uh, with relevant experience uh, to your uh, issues problems opportunities as well uh, like Aroma Ravi uh, today um, I would like to encourage you as well to. 
people sitting here in the, in the audience, uh, you could also comment or ask questions through Twitter if you have, uh, if you're connected through your uh, mobile devices. Uh, we are also slowly trying to introduce the, the new hashtag, which is Cup Talks, uh, um, like uh, Kapuscinski Talks. Uh, so enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much. everyone and uh, thank you to, um, to my colleagues for the words of introduction and particularly Gordon Perry also from ACC who has been uh, working furiously to make all of this possible. We live in strange times um, in, in, in many ways. Um, information is ubiquitous. We know about uh, the most intimate details of what is going on in Syria through to uh, the latest disaster that may have befallen another part of the world. And of course, our daily lives revolve around whatever soap opera unfolds within our specific countries or cities and so forth. And what this reminds of us, all, of course, is that we are fundamentally interconnected. And this has become profoundly apparent in the most recent times as we realize that there is nothing that happens within our lives or within our countries or in our cities that doesn't immediately become topical in, in the most furthest corners of the world. And in the case of South Africa, of course, um, uh, particular trials around athletes and around visitors to our city um, uh, is what <coughs> constitutes the imaginary about South Africa at the moment and about Africa in many ways. And this is, of course, uh, completely devoid of any realism or reality but it speaks to the disjuncture between what interconnectedness via a mediatized world means and our different consciousness that is required. Now, what this also reminds us, of course, is that we live in a vortex of extreme economic instability, dramatic environmental change, and constant and often violent social upheaval. And amidst, at the, at the epicenter of this vortex, what we are confronted with is the incapacity of our governments and our states to understand what this requires in terms of new global governance and sub-regional governance arrangements. And whilst our governments are essentially struggling to come to terms with the radicality of transformation that is required, there are few people in the world that are able to read the signs of the times, that are able to then connect the signs of the times to what is required at the level of thought, at the level of institutional retooling, and at the level of building new cultural imaginaries. I can think of no other person on this planet, through my work, that stands out as a leader in this regard than Arama Revi. So it is an incredibly profound privilege and honor to be able to introduce him tonight and to draw attention to some of his many, many accomplishments. Now, we've provided a synopsis of, of, his, of his bio uh, for everyone in the audience and on the website, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, most recently, um, he, in the last six, seven years, he's been spearheading an unprecedented initiative in the context of India, where he's building up a prospective independent national university for research and innovation that will address specifically the challenges of urbanization, and in the process, invent a new field of study called urban practice. Alongside that, if that's not an ambitious enough job, he's also been very active on the global stage. He's a member of the Leadership Council of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, established by the Secretary General of the UN, and in that capacity as co-chair of the Urban Thematic Group, and through that work, they've been able to spearhead a global campaign over the last 18 months that have seen us bringing together multiple universities, social movements, and a range of, of cities and city leaders to all insist that as we configure, as we contemplate what the world is that we are making and what the world is that we will be inheriting by 2030 as defined by proxy through the next generation of sustainable development goals, 
that we really come to terms with what the urban transition means for that conversation. And this is an uphill battle. It is a complex challenge. And as you will hear tonight, I am sure that there is absolutely no one better to be leading this particular um, intellectual and political and policy challenge. And so I encourage you and I invite you to not just lap up what you will hear over the next 50 minutes, but to engage with the ongoing work of both uh, the urban group of the SDNS, but also with the remarkable work that the Indian Institute for Human Settlements are creating at the moment. And in that process, not simply admire Arama's work from afar, but also become part of this incredibly important and urgent movement that is required to see social justice in the world, and most importantly, in our cities. So Arama, with a warm Cape Town welcome, please share with us your thoughts tonight. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Minister, representatives of UNDP and the European Commission. It's a great pleasure to be back in Cape Town, to be back at UCT and to spend time with colleagues and friends um, <clears throat> at the African Center for Cities. I think this is really appropriate in some ways uh, and sort of interesting that we have a South Asian speaking at the first uh, lecture in Africa of this Kapuczynski series, especially because for so many years, for many of us who've read his work, uh, he's one of the great uh, travelers and humanists who's not only spanned Africa, but if you read some of his books, has spent a lot of time getting lost and doing interesting stuff in Asia, especially in India. His, his renditions of what happened in India when he was there and afterwards are actually very interesting. A very special person, uh, you know, somebody who kept the histories under his, uh, evidently under his pillow, and used that as a way of trying to understand uh, and sort of redirect how the world is currently sort of constructed. Um, and what I find personally very interesting is unbelievable that somebody of his ilk and time would arrive at extreme events in political and social history uh, and record them and also comment on them as, uh, you know, both as a scholar uh, and as somebody sort of engaged in contemporary events. So I'm really glad and honored to be here. And I'm going to be sort of provocative in this discussion, open up something that's qu quite interesting. I'm going to try and tell you a story, not in the, in the vein and the capacities of Kapuczynski, but very much within the Indian sort of tradition of storytelling. Uh, it will neither be science nor social science. Uh, it will sort of neither be structured nor unstructured, but it will have many layers to it. And I will sort of um, encourage you to look at the deeper questions that are hidden behind uh, in, in, in this process. And in some senses, the key sort of protagonists of this tale, if I were to call it so, um, are the planet, um, the states, especially nation states, which are engaged with this, with this engagement, and us as citizens and people uh, in at least two different incarnations, which I'll try and show you. So we're going to be talking about uh, urbanization, but I try and sort of lay it out in a much wider frame. Whoops. academics and researchers and policy makers and, you know, a whole range of us to work on this. You know, if, if I go back to Gandhi, Gandhi was very simple in his way of looking at things. The real touchstone of all of this stuff that we do, the investments that we make, the policies that are set together is really about changing the everyday lives of ordinary people. And if you're not able to do that, much of our research, much of our thinking, much of our doing actually doesn't make much sense. And I guess the core thing that we're talking about here is the role of cities and towns in making that possible. Cities and towns have been around for at least 5,000 years, if not longer, uh, but we are coming to a, a period in, in, in the life of this planet, about 100 years between, let's say, the mid-1950s to 2050, where we will shift from being predominantly an agrarian, rural civilization across the world, even though some bits have been more urban than others, to one that's predominantly urban. And while this is happening centrally at the moment in Asia, 
It's not very long before it will happen in Africa. And I guess that's the preparation. The question is, how can you enable these processes to make changes in the lives of ordinary people in everyday working? But to do that, I guess one has to examine how these kind of changes may take place and what the big constraints are. So if I were to jump from an image of, of Africa to one of India, that's the Red Fort in New Delhi, the place where the you know, Prime Minister of India gives a big speech at Independence Day. But inside this image are held some of the very interesting structural challenges that one deals with. It's not only a question of dealing with everyday life. Every life is important, and that's how things actually change. It changes with us and the structures that we're part of. But they're also constrained and great opportunities around the structures that we see here. So what you see here, right in the top here, is the fort which was built by Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan, the man who made the Taj Mahal. Um, and that is, in a sense, India's pre-colonial past. And then inside there, we have heritage buildings, more than 100 years old, that the British built for us there. Those are the barracks of the British when they actually occupied this fort for 150 years and, and ruled this country. So we have this great tension in, 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 in Indian urbanism between the pre-colonial, which is on this side of the city. If you go back, you'll see Shah Jahan's great world city of that point of time. The colonial, which infects our imagination and our imaginaries of what should actually happen. New Delhi, which is you know, built and designed by more or less the same people who built and designed Pretoria, so you understand that process. Uh, uh, the modern, okay? The sort of, the modern construction, this is the metro, uh, the big metro mall there. But the most important thing is something that you cannot see in this photograph. And the Prime Minister, when he stands on the ramparts of Red Fort to address a nation, sometimes doesn't know exist, but is very central. We had at one point of time or almost um, 150,000 people living in the riverbed that runs behind this great fort. And that, I think, is the most important challenge that we deal with in our, in, in our cities, at least in the South Asian context, trying to maintain a continuity across what may, one may call 500 years between the pre-colonial, the colonial, the modern, and the informal. It's coming together and finding solutions that can actually bridge that. And this, in some senses, is a, this is the power of Kapuczynski because he talks about the informal, he talks about the everyday life, and through that he's able to analyze and understand you know, the great predicament of, of, of humanity and people at this current point of time. So that's the context. If I step back and look at this with a more theoretical frame, the question then is how does one make change in the systems? How can one make the kind of changes or enable the kind of changes that, that sort of you know, enable these kind of big transformations. This is from uh, a piece of work that I was sort of tangentially involved with, um, a mentor and, and a very famous environmental scientist called Danella Meadows. Uh, she put together a wonderful article, very short, recommend that to students here, which looked at the leverage points in a system. And I'll refer to this because there's a very interesting uh, South African policy document that came out a month ago which talked about these levers of change. The question here is, as a system scientist, as somebody who looks at how change can be affected and catalyzed, what are the ways of doing it? And she lays, she lays down there, you know, 12 different ways of making significant change. I'm not going to be dealing with, with the stuff that's in the gray because most of us in our everyday life focus on those questions, on the constant parameters and numbers, you know. How much compensation do I get? What are the currency you know, dollar conversion rate, what are the growth rates at functions? Those are the things that we fight about, but effectively, if we want to deal with structural change, if we want to look, look at things that make the lives of people and countries and society different, the most important things are way down there at number five, four, and three. How does one change the rules of the system? South Africa is a remarkable example to the world because you had a set of rules which were unacceptable to a society and to the rest of the world, and through a long period of struggle, you change the rules, and then, of course, you reorganized your institutional systems, number four, the power to add, to change, to evolve, and self-organize. And that process, as we're seeing, is, is not complete. We talk about that in the context of apartheid planning, and apartheid planning, in some senses, in the way that it, your spatial structure of your cities is, is currently organized, and, you know, Vanessa Watson is here. She's shown that to me with my, you know, with my own eyes. It's something that is still alive today because it's deeply ingrained in the process. To change that is one of the most significant urban and political problems you're dealing with. But, but finally, if you want to change all these processes, the thing that makes the most significant difference is to change the goals of that system, to change where the system thinks it's going. And of course, the system is us. It's not something outside us. It is to change the goals that we're looking forward to. So for example, something like maybe 200 years ago, we decided, or some parts of the world decided, 
that slavery was an unacceptable form of engagement, something that's dramatically changed and impacted the history of Africa you know, for 500 years. The system goals were changed. It took a tremendous amount of conflict, potentially ending in, in the American Civil War, to actually upend that process. And of course, slavery still persists in many parts of the world today in different forms. But that was an idea that ended. We changed the goal, which said that it was, it was unacceptable for us to use other human beings to be able to maintain our economic and social systems. Similarly, the idea of human rights um, and a whole range of other processes, the European Union is very much part of that whole engagement here, are fundamental changes in the way that the goals of the system were set. So in 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human, human Rights essentially set out a set of goals for all countries at that point of time, it was a reorientation of how the world might actually work itself to. It also came, of course, with the process of decolonization. So what I'm saying is we're actually at a very interesting juncture at the moment around sustainability, something that's emerged over the last 40 or 50 years as a critical question in which we may require a reset, a reorganization of the core goals that the world, our countries, um, and our institutions need to be dealt with. And of course, the most difficult things. Changing mindsets and paradigms, that's a lot of what science is all about. Uh, in sort of engaging and actually throwing up processes by which mindsets and paradigms are changed, these are the most dramatic changes that are there. And of course, something that happens very rarely, millennium events, when we're able to transcend paradigms, um, you know, we go back, of course, to the axial age, 500 years before um, <clears throat> the, the start of, you know, our, our, our two millennia here, and you had, in many parts of the world, a whole range of people, uh, many of them from, from our continent, who are asking fundamental questions. And that, of course, enables us, at least in that point of time, through the faith traditions, to understand what those paradigms are and actually work beyond that. One of the questions which I'll come to later is, is it possible and is it necessary for us to engage with that? Does the urban transformation actually bring up questions that, that require us to look up the trans transcending of these paradigms? So that's the frame that I'm looking at. In, in the context we're dealing with, the 21st century is, of course, an extension of the 20th. We lived through that. We were, many of us were born in the 20th and we're going up in the 21st. But the 21st century is going to be fundamentally different. This is a fantastic image from, from Northern Europe. And I hope uh, we will see something similar here around Cape Town. You have the wind. Uh, if, this might be the big renewables transition that we see here in the next 15 or 20 years as you, know, you, you move out of, 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 let's say, your coal dependence. So the basic contention that I'm, that I'm making here is the 21st century may be very different from the long 20th century. One of the things that's very obvious is that the, the, the larger economic powers of the 21st century are not going to be rich, are not going to be OECD-like. Uh, and that makes a fundamental difference for the nature of power and engagement across the world. Now that's sort of the, the obvious thing, but more than that, I think the most important thing that happened to us in 69, uh, when we got our first images that came up from Apollo 11, uh, was the realization, because we could now look at ourselves, that there is actually only one Earth, and it's a very, very fragile planet, and we are messing with it in very significant ways. And unfortunately, uh, we've messed with it so seriously that it's coming back to bite us in some senses. So the planet will survive. The question is, Will our cities, will our civilizations, will our way of working with our economy survive in that context? Now, there's no question about the planet surviving this. The planet has been doing that for a very, very long time. And of course, the other thing is, there is no place to escape to, because we just do not have the resources to set up something that can get off this planet. So we have to manage with what we have. We have, we have to considerably reconstruct the ideas that we have of how to deal with that. And then the other big thing, which is, if you look at the long sweep of history, this is based on some of the work that I'd done earlier, based on Madison's work there. If you look at economic development and how it's actually structured, you see a fundamental change. So this is the 17th and the 18th century, India and China basically producing about 55% of world output. You have this decolonization, this, this whole colonial engagement that's there, the buildup of the European colonies. And of course, you know, unfortunately, I couldn't put South Africa there because you're somewhere very close to the, to the uh, <laughs> y-axis. Uh, you see the whole you know, the, the whole Russian engagement and, and sort of the, the post-Soviet collapse, you see Japan working out. The big and most interesting thing, of course, is this, is this massive bounce back uh, by China, which is actually going to be one of the most important defining events. And India, of course, we're not, we're not very competent at this kind of stuff. We're about 20 years behind them. But basically, Asia is returning to the center of the global economic system. 
And that's a significant change. This has, I guess, significant sort of opportunities and challenges for South Africa specifically, because now the center of the world system is no longer around the Atlantic. It's shifted to the Pacific, and it's about to shift even more significantly to the Pacific Indian Ocean. So there is a change, and you know, let's be a little provocative here. This is not the normal way that Northern European maps are, are set up. They're, maybe the lights are, can you recognize South Africa? It's up there towards the north. <laughs> so why, why, why did I set this up this way? Because from the 16th century onwards, this, the red dots here in some senses, were the center of the world system. That started collapsing, of course, about 100 years ago with the end of the First World War. And then you have a buildup of these regions, the Asia Pacific, South Asia, Southern Africa, um, you know, Brazil, and, and, and that part of Latin America, Central America. And of course, the big questions that are in, in yellow, the emergence of West Africa, past of East Africa, and, um, and Indonesia, and parts of, of, of West Africa. And the reason I picked this up is this is evidence that you can see from space. This is a footprint of cities. So if you look at the change, and I'll show you a set of slides around that, this is really the driving force that we will see. So what I'm saying is the geography, the geography of development, the geography of, of, of the world economy, et cetera, is shifting, and we need to understand and, 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 and deal with it. So these sort of new urban geographies are actually going to create new histories. There's an interaction between the two, which we have to understand and appreciate very carefully. And then, of course, because we are now, you know, seven and a half billion going to nine billion, and we like to believe that there is no frontier that we cannot conquer, including the atmosphere, the oceans, and everything else. This is just one aspect of global environmental change. I work a little bit on this. That is, this is from the latest IPCC assessment report, the, which just came out last, last week, things that we were part of. Um, the big issue here, of course, is that here, we're pretty much on track to a four degree world. Two degree is dangerous climate change. A four degree world is actually almost unthinkable. We have the evidence here, it's very clear. We can see steps, sort of system by system, that we are in deep trouble. What's the evidence of that? Those of you who climb mountains here, you might recognize this mountain. Not too many mountain climbers here, excepting people who go up on top of Table Mountain here. This is Everest. This is a photograph taken by Mallory in 1921. Uh, Royal Geographic Society team went back and after a lot of difficulty, they relocated the exact spot. And they took this photograph in 2009. That's what happened to that glacier. This is real, it's happening. I mean, I can tell you from the science side, but this is real, it's, it's going to happen. It is happening, extreme weather is happening in our lifetimes. But the thing that's, that, that really bothers me in this, and we've talked about that, is the ecological implications. So this is a very simple graph. I won't take time to talk about it very much. This looks at the maximum speed at which species can move you know, through natural processes of, 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 of sort of ecological succession, fine? Different species going all the way from trees to freshwater mollusks. This is from the latest IPCC report. And when we saw this, you know, some of us were both stunned and wanted to cry at the same time because these are the lines that show you what happens as the isotherms move towards the north and the southern pole. So essentially what we're saying is we're pretty much here at the moment. This is where we'll probably be if nothing happens in Paris next year. So we're saying if this is the rate, if the isotherms are moving at 20 kilometers per year, trees can't make it on their own. Some other species, rodents, primates may make it. Of course, agricultural systems may, may make it because people may make it happen. But the basic ecosystems that we're, that we're functioning with, the stuff that we see in the high biodiversity regions of, of, of Cape Town around this, you know, one of the world's great biodiversity spots, that won't make it. It is just not ecologically possible for that movement to take place. So we're in, we're in really deep trouble. It's there. The evidence is very clear. And we need to probably do something about it. So if I were to put it into a very, very simple framing, the fundamental challenge of the 21st century as far as human systems are concerned is our present consumption requires two worlds. We've been in, in ecological deficits since the mid-1980s. Population growth, 
because we're going to go from seven and a half to nine, nine and a half billion. We're not sure exactly what it is, but it's going to go plus nine. We'll require one and a half worlds. Ending poverty, which is absolutely the most important priority for countries like us, and also much of the low and middle income countries will require about two worlds because of the acute deprivation that large people live in. If you add this two up, uh, these three up, you have five and a half worlds. We only have one. And we have to sort this in less than a century. Because that climate process, just one of many large global environmental changes, whether it's desertification or biodiversity loss, is there and we've created it. It's not something that's come to us from, from the outside. So it's incumbent on us to actually take a position and do something significant about that. So given this broad sweep of history, where we are and where it might be, the question that comes up is, why are cities important in this whole process? You know, have cities got a role? Cities are interesting. You know, some people do some stuff inside it. But governments typically have not been very interested in this, excepting, you know, when they tend to rebel or create particular kinds of problems. So a quick rendition here of why cities are important. This is just a, a slice of the urban sphere, just cities that are bigger than three quarter of a million, 100 years ago, before the First World War. And what you find, the population of the world at that time was 1.5 billion. It seems like an odd number. You know, India's population is coming close to that. China is pretty much there already. The urban share of the world population was just 13%. And you can see that for where the big cities are. There's London, there's Paris, the big European cities. You find the Northeast in the US, Chicago, uh, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, et cetera. That's, that's, that, that's Nairobi here. And of course, we have the two big colonial cities in India. But the interesting thing that you should watch in this set of slides, of course, is the gross world product. The estimates of the gross world product at that point of time, just before the Second World War, uh, First World War, was $2, million, $2 trillion. The urban share was significant, 30%. Let's fast forward to 1950. Post-war, you know, after a tremendous amount of destruction across the world, um, including in, 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 in Poland and et cetera, and what do you see here? First thing that you see is a growth of a lot of cities across the world in pretty much every geography. But again, primarily, like I showed you earlier, around the North Atlantic, fine. Population goes up from 1.5 to 2.5 billion. The urban share goes from 13 to 29%. World product grows from 2 to 7%, and the urban share jumps very dramatically. Uh, because there's a sudden movement that's starting to take place. And then, let me jump to the present. World population jumping from 2.5 billion 50 years later to 7. Urban share, of course, this is why many of us are here. We suddenly realize that the world has become urban and there are more people in cities than otherwise. But actually, the transition had taken place much, much earlier. The gross world product in urban areas had actually turned over in the 1980s. And this is the number to watch. We've gone from 7 trillion to 70 trillion in 60 years. A tremendous expanse of economic output. Of course, differential across the world. And most important in that is that cities are the key driver of this process. So when I talk to mayors across the world, I think, look, it's not the question of the people who live there. Of course, it's about that. But the real thing that's driving this process, the thing that we have to look out from, from the consumption side, from the output side, from the employment side, is the urban economy. And the urban economy, for better or for worse, and most incremental jobs are driven by cities. And that is why, and that is why, especially in today, post-2008, cities are absolutely critical. So if I look at the UN pop division projections, just, just, just look at these, these, these maps. L look, look at the growth of cities across the face of the world. You know, in some senses, it could look like a blight. But on the other hand, those are the places that are creating the jobs, they are creating the economic opportunities. That's what enabling the transformation of societies, of course, with the risks and the externalities that this kind of process goes. So it, you know, it, it gives with one and it takes with the other. So let's look at what's happening here. As you move, just the incremental world product from the cities is over, you know, it's close to a trillion dollars a year. So this is, this is the big story that we're just getting to understand now in the world economic system, within the United Nations, and of course within critical countries. Of course, a country that is probably understood it the best, that has enabled this big transformation over the last 20 years, um, China, is the country that has been able to take so many people out of poverty, and in a sense has enabled us to achieve at global scale the MDGs. I mean, if it wasn't for this Chinese urbanization, the largest urbanization in history, 10 million people transforming you know, their lives from one side to the other side, this would not have, would have, not have happened. But the same thing, is about to happen in South Asia, 
And frankly, we're not prepared for it. And that's why we're building this, hopefully this great university to address that question. And because I haven't shown you stuff after 2025, the big, big move after that is actually going to come from Sub-Saharan Africa. So my encouragement to you is prepare yourself for this because there is no reason that we should go through the same kind of problems that we went through in other places if you prepare yourself for this in, in Southern Africa. You have the, the advantage of, of, of being a latecomer in the process. Use that advantage best. The interesting thing about the urban process, of course, is because cities enable concentration. They enable concentration and hence economies of scale and scope. And of course, you know, as I said, the negative externalities, the concentration of risk. Cities concentrate not only economic activity, but a whole range of other processes. All of these eight transitions happen in cities, are very strongly driven by cities. The demographic one, which is very important to the global turnover, the health transition, which is now going in two directions, non-communicable and communicable at the same time, the education transition, of course. You know, how many universities have you heard of that live and function in rural areas in the world? Very few, because you know, it's, it's a function of cities for the last 5,000 years to be able to contain that. The energy transition is going to be played out in cities. Similarly, the environmental transition, especially in the cities of the global south, is happening at the same time. We're doing brown and green and gray all at the same time. And that, that, that is a big challenge for us. We're doing this in 20 or 40 years. Things that took you know, Europe 200 years are happening in one-tenth of that period of time. So it's obvious that we will make mistakes. We really don't know how to do it. Nobody's ever done this in all of history at that scale. Similarly, something that's enabling tremendous you know, transformation, the information transition, especially in our, in, our, in our country, it's connecting people, it's enabling people to talk to each other, to connect across the world as we can see in this sort of internet um, uh, uh, webcast. So all of these things are only possible because of the role that cities play. But, of course, there's a false side to that. And the false side is that cities also concentrate risk. So, you know, the contention that we've had for some time is that urbanization is just not a mega trend. It's not something that we also have to cope with. You know, it's not only like, whatever, an energy transition, et cetera. It is a giga trend. It's something that happens every four or 5,000 years. The only challenge for us is, for many of us in the global south, is happening in less than a century. In some countries, it's happening in 40 or 50 years. Uh, and the question is, can we build the institutional capacity? Can we build the understanding? Can we build the culture? Can we build the technologies that, it, that, that can enable us to use this opportunity for change and use it for, 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 for good? And of course, the big question is, the contra question is, is this kind of urbanization inevitable? Is it something that's going to happen? Should we just sit back and let it go? And of course, the hidden question within the brackets is, is this kind of urbanization that you see there? And of course, this is a great symbol of, 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 of liberty and freedom, which created Manhattan. But is this, and you know, you have the new tower there, so it's a contemporary photograph, very recent. <laughs> I took it when I was at the General Assembly recently. But whether this kind of urbanization is inevitable across the world. And I think this question of imaginaries and how they translate is a very important one. We have scholars in this room who have written about this. And I think this is a critical question for Africa, for Asia, and you know, for, for a lot of us. This is a great thing for its time. But is it something that we want to have for all time? This is, what, is, this, is this where we want to consign the future of our people and our cities to? Is something we need to look at quite carefully. And let me take you back in history. I'll take you back to a place that you never heard of. Uh, this was a world city in its time, but its time was a long, long time back, 4,500 years ago. This city actually, the reason I put this up here is we talk about sustainability as far as cities are concerned, and we think about 100 years or 200 years, and that sort of, that really challenges our planners because planners typically think in 10, 20, 30, et cetera. They think in decades. This city persisted as a key trading city for 1,000 years. It was inhabited for 1,000 years. So the question is, can we learn something from these examples? Even though they were in different contexts, the world was much smaller, et cetera, et cetera. It's a city called Dholeverev uh, as part of the sort of Indus system that's there. This is a reconstruction uh, from archaeologists. And the interesting thing about it, because you know, that's from photographs that, that I've taken there, is that there was a shift in the climate system at that time, which actually, at least there's a lot of academic debate on this, actually crashed the system. But you can see that in how the city actually adapted over the thousand years, how they built these massive reservoirs. And this is, you know, this is a copper culture. This is a calculated culture. They've cut into the living rock here. You can see the scale of the person here. 85 by, by 10 now by 80. You know, the size and scale of these reservoirs are unbelievable. When you stand in that as a person and imagine that they've been chiseled out, you know, brick by brick by hand to be able to enable this settlement to survive is something that we have to actually understand. So 
It's not that the challenges that we're meeting today are unique. Many of them have been met before in different circumstances, of course. So this city or this town, we didn't have, by our standards, of course, it's a town. You know, today in India, anything un under 10,000 is, you know, a village. Uh, this city and town actually had remarkable systems, which there is, a, there is a village just next to this. This had underground sewers and water supply, and it had a water harvesting system about 4,000 years ago. The village that's next to it doesn't have toilets. That is the contradiction of development as we have it today. So what I'm saying is there's tremendous lessons to us for us to learn from the past and transcreate into the future. Another great history, and you know, it has a connection with Cape Town, is the, the, the world city of Goa, the city of the black ships, which went from Portugal to China and Japan. Look at the population of Goa. 1550, one of the great world cities at the time, 200,000 people, remarkable. You know, the arsenal in Goa is bigger than the arsenal in Venice at that point of time because of the amount of, you know, of, of, of wealth that went, went through. But what happened? In less than 200 years, the city died. And the city died because it did not understand the environment in which it was functioning. Very simple thing. We, we talk about an environmental health. They had dug wells and they had cesspools. And it's no wonder that they had sequence after sequence of cholera, malaria, typhoid, and plague. Eventually, the Inquisition, the Inquisition decided that this was a cursed city. And what we have today, and this is a World Heritage Site, is nothing left of the fabric and just the cathedrals because the people took away the buildings and rebuilt a new capital 15 kilometers away. So what I'm saying is there's a lot for us to learn from history. Unfortunately, in our country, maybe we, are, we spend too much time thinking about the past. But there are lessons that you know, we should have learned as people. So in the current context, in the current context, that's Mumbai. And the interesting thing, and this is not the text, it is the Browns. The Browns is a piece of work that my, my colleagues uh, worked on maybe eight years ago. That's the mapping of the informal settlements in the city. So the question, of course, and you can see that. Look at the scale of informality in the city. That, that's, those are the slum areas. 60 percent of the city actually lives in these informal settlements. And that's not because they want to live that way. It is because our economic systems have failed. There's a very severe land market failure here, which is designed and orchestrated. So what I'm saying is we are perpetrators and creators of the processes that we've forgotten about in, in the past. Uh, and this is what's happening in a great world city. And you'll just see that in, you know, in a second just now. And if I, if I go back again to global scale, this is what we're doing. This is the observed changes in climate change. All the major cities of the world mapped out from here. This is the historical record. Let's look at what might happen in the future. This is what the IPCC has put together. This is from a chapter that, we, that some of us wrote. Here we are in Cape Town. This is the, the great scenario where we actually, you know, if Kyoto had happened, if the COP in Paris actually works itself out, this is where we might go. But actually, this is where we may actually land up. OK? Six degrees at the poles, about one and a half, two degrees at the mean in one of the more, sorry, uh, one of the more, uh, sorry, where am I going to? Yeah, uh, one of the more interesting sort of, you know, better organized. So the thing to see here, of course, is the spread of cities and the range of temperatures that we'll expect to see. So it's not, it's not only the question of heat. Heat, of course, is a, the proximate thing in, in the tropics. It's also the water systems, which I haven't shown yet. This is just temperature. This is stuff that we, we are pretty well we can pretty well understand. So look at the distribution of the temperature, and look at the distribution of the city. So what I'm saying is there's a continuity of that experience. Whether you go back to Dolavaya and people trying to deal with, with climate issues there, the environmental health questions of Goa, and of course every culture in every city will be able to talk to us about this. Because the history of civilization and its collapses, and that's why I asked the question, is it inevitable that we will have this urbanization? It isn't. If you look at the history of civilization, in more cases than, 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 than one, in fact pretty much all of them, the collapse of cities has led to the collapse <clears throat> of, of cultures. So where we're going to is not inevitable. It's based on the choices that we make and the way that we take it forward. So you know, we can stand back and say, oh, well, you know, at the end of the day, we're all dead. Nothing can happen about it, et cetera. The inverse question is, is urban transformation possible? And many people across the world, especially from governments, uh, are not necessarily sure that this can be done. It's you know, people like us or practitioners who work in cities and municipal officials who feel that this might be possible. I think this is a question that we have to ask us again and again. Is this really possible? Can we convert, you know, this, this could be an Asian city, this is actually an African one. Uh, can we convert this chaos into something different? 
It's actually not chaos. It's actually very well ordered. It's extremely productive. It does remarkable things that you can't see unless you have the eyes to see it. And I guess one of the answers is in these two images from a city that I, this is Shanghai, um, just about the time of the turn of Deng, Deng Xiaoping. Okay, that's, we're standing and at uh, uh, Pushi looking at Pudong. This is the Bund here. This is the old French settlement, all the you know, wonderful stuff, those of us who have been there. That is the farmlands that have just been turned into some kind of economic development, fine. This is 1987. So if you do not believe, of course, there's a dystopia that's hidden behind this. But the fact is that these changes are real, they're happening, you can touch them, you can feel them. Uh, and this is the ascendance of China and of course the big, big political uh, move that took place at that point of time to turn towards the West, to turn to, uh, to economic trade, to join the WTO, etc. This is the physical manifestation of the process. So this is certainly possible. The question is whether this kind of transformation is what will do the best for us within the constraints that we're functioning with. The environmental constraints, more important, especially if we've seen this, the sweeping changes in North Africa, the social constraints, because before the environmental limits are reached, I'm fairly certain from my own experience, it is the social and political constraints that will really create the biggest challenges that we have. So I guess the critical question for us then is, we know the transformation can happen locally, and you know, South Africa is an interesting example of how that can happen. We know that the big transformation that's necessary at the global scale, how can we link that? And is it possible to do that? And I think that is the heart of the question of the urban SDG. Can we actually link the two together? Is there a connection between them? How can it be sorted out? Of course, Rio is a fantastic example of this. On this side, you have Copacabana, and on this side, you have an entire city of favelas. So it really is, and, and, and you know, people were on the street, 200,000 of them were on the street last year, you know, asking for a whole range of things, saying, look, you know, we, we need some things, but please, for God's sake, give us our toilets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, the linkage between the local and the global, I think, is a very interesting question. It is an important political question of the 21st century, and I do not think that we've engaged with it adequately. In some senses, at least from those of us who look at it from, let's say, a little bit more theoretical side, there are five dichotomies that we have to resolve. And I'll just deal with them very, very quickly because the story is sort of longer and I don't want to hold you up. The first one is the imagination of the rural versus the urban. There is this imagination across many, many parts of the world, certainly in my country, which is, you know, whatever it is, 31% urban, even as I believe in South Africa, that it's important, as far as the urban elites are concerned, to keep rural people in the places where they are so that they can be better off and more people don't come to cities. This is not how urbanization takes place. All the urban scholars will tell you that it doesn't work this way. It's, it's, it's much more complex. There are a whole range of other processes that are there. But we persist because of our public structures, the way the state is organized in many places, to partition this out. And I understand the reason for it. It's much easier to have a department or a ministry of urban development and rural development and break them down and you can manage things differently. But the core question here, of course, is the understanding of speciality, of how space plays itself out in development. And that's something that in the creation of the nation states as they came to some parts of the world from, from, from Europe was an important part in terms of territory, but not in terms of the, the internal dynamics of how, how settlements and structures were organized. So that's the first question. That, that ties itself up with the second question, which is, I guess, a deep political thing that we're dealing with just now, is the relationship between national government, the nation state, and regional and local governments. Uh, the questions of subsidiarity, the questions of agency, and the real question of, if we are going to have nine billion people on the planet, how 200 entities, even though they may be extremely powerful, have, have all the resources and the taxes and the capacity, can actually manage the future of so many billion people. That's a governance challenge that even the Chinese have not been up to trying to do. I mean, they have a fairly decentralized system when they want to do it. So this is something that's actually burnt in to our constitutional structures in many parts of the world. It's burnt into our imaginations. And this is something that we do need to look at, to my point, uh, to, my, to my mind. And of course, the big question which came to us from Brundtland in the WCD, part of Rio, et cetera, is intergenerational versus intragenerational questions. And of course, which comes before the other? And there's been a big debate on this. And I think, you know, for those of us who work with poverty and vulnerability, there's no chance that you can deal with intergenerational questions, uh, intergenerational questions, unless you deal with intergenerational questions, especially questions of poverty and inequality. And, you know, that's, that's a debate that's very important. It's central to the question of cities. Uh, and then finally, something which I'll just touch upon. I mean, this is a subject maybe of, of a longer lecture. And that is 
how we actually give precedence to particular forms of capital. Now, you know, in, in academic circles, Piketty's become very interesting and, you know, become flavor of the year, etc. But he makes an important point, and that is that in that sequence of, of, sequence of capitals, and I'll just lay them out, four of them, financial capital, physical capital, human capital, and natural capital, right? So natural capital is the capital that, you know, attracts least interest and the lowest return on investment because most of that is sort of externalized and we don't actually count it. That's the reason why a lot of this stuff is there, right? Human capital in many parts of the world, especially those parts of the world that are flush with capital is something that you don't necessarily count, but that's probably the most important thing that we require for development in the global south. So even there, returns on investment may be slightly higher than in the natural capital domain, in agriculture, in mining, and whatever it is. But in, in the imagination, the kind of space that will be given to, let's say, the human capital domain is, is somewhat less in terms of returns. And then, of course, you have physical capital, the basis of industrialization, the reason why we've had this great debate in the SDGs about whether we should have a separate industrial goal or not, because the standard form of development means that you've got to move from agrarian to industrial to post-industrial, right? So that's the next step. And then finally, of course, the thing that's driving the world as we see it, and certainly our cities, financial capital. And what Piketty talks about is the fact that as long as financial capital is privileged over the real economy, you're going to see a movement of capital between generation to generation to the people who actually control the financial capital. And that is what, if you look at that cascade between financial, physical, human, and natural capital, creates the structural instability, the inequality, which we're coping with. So whether it's farmers whose children do not want to come and, and practice agriculture across the world because they need to come to cities, they want to be educated, they want to move from that into a profession which can actually produce stuff, and we have national development plans that are trying to industrialize to make that happen and create jobs. Or of course, you know, everybody wants to go off and become a merchant banker and, and be in one of the great you know, centers of, of, of world capital. That is a set of rules that we have set for ourselves, and we know from environmental economics, from the work that many of us do, that those rules do not work in the real world. Nature doesn't respect them. The second law doesn't respect them. And yet we persist with that because that's, that's a wonderful mythology that's worked for certain parts of the world. But it's worked for a certain period of time and for a frontier economy. And that's the interesting thing that Piketty shows. He shows that it works for the United States for a particular period in its history. But if you take a longer view of it, there's some deep contradictions that we, we shouldn't necessarily base ourselves on. So I'm saying that these processes actually underpin the debate. And if you don't go back to them, I don't think we'll be able to unbundle the process very clearly. So the question then is how we try to respond to this at global scale. We tried to respond in the late sort of 1990s by setting up the Millennium Development Goals. So what's the big difference? And I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fairly, I'm going to characterize it. Obviously, it's much more complex, and I wouldn't make this kind of a, a statement in, in a purely academic uh, context. So there's a common genealogy between them, and you can actually trace it back to WCD from that to 48 and the human rights, you know, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is this whole idea that you can set goals and actually redirect how development and processes will, will work itself out. But the interesting difference, at least in my characterization of it, is the MDGs were relatively easy to do because they were agreed. You know, the big compact post-war, et cetera, et cetera, starting with Europe and going everywhere else, so decolonization worked itself out. The MDGs were fundamentally about development goals for poor people in poor countries. So a large part of the world, not a very large part of the world economy, and hence, in some senses, the sort of political economy of aid and transfer of technology, et cetera, could work. We're in a slightly different situation because of two things, at least you know, in my contention. One is 2008, which actually has shaken the basis of the, of, of the world economy in many places, and I guess uh, both the U.S. and Europe are, are really hurting on this. And, you know, we know that the emerging markets are actually driving two-thirds of the growth at the current point of time. That's one thing. The second thing is the realization that the environmental externalities are very serious and we can't run away from them. Those two things, in a sense, have allowed us politically to create a framework now that embraces all people in all places. And this is a huge shift. I mean, just analytically, it's a huge shift because you're dealing now with countries at $500 per capita and others at $100,000 a capita, almost two orders of magnitude together. They're both in the same frame. They sit in the UN and we're debating a common framework because there are many things that connect us. As humans, of course, the question is, does the connection work for nation states? Does it work for firms? Does it work for other entities that sort of deliver and manage the system? 
And I guess, as I said, the closing window of opportunity, new actors at the table. And you know, one thing, having seen this uh, again since the MDGs, the thing that does strike me a lot is post-2008, the private sector is very strongly in the room for real and obvious reasons. Because if you want to do trillion dollar infrastructure or even billion dollar infrastructure, if you don't bring in private capital and if you don't bring in private executors, it's almost impossible for you to do it. Um, so that's a big shift. And of course, the discussion which is hidden behind, you know, in some ways closed doors, is the question of an, a new global governance architecture. Not only at the level of security, et cetera, et cetera, but the fact is that development now or sustainable development is essential to the project of bringing the world together and making sure that we don't tank the system, whether socially or politically, as far as that's concerned. So about a year ago, uh, the SDSN, which I'm part of, actually framed this in a fairly simple way. And this came from the experience of Agenda 21, et cetera, et cetera, and said, look, if we are spanning all of the things that are of critical concern to us in development, we need to have not too many goals. It have to be, they have to be relatively simple. Uh, they have to, of course, uh, encompass the challenges that, 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 that are determined by each sector. But more than that, they have to be simple enough that young people can actually understand them. Because in some senses, these are not things that you, you know, set up models around. They are aspirational. They're direction pointed. They point you in a direction which you can then test, like I started with. Is it making a difference to my everyday life? Is it making the difference to my commute, to the job security I have, to the kind of quality of food I have, to the health care that I have? So this is a set of 10. And you know, I won't sort of deal with it in detail. But what I will highlight is 6 and 7. So when we, when we had an intense debate on this, what you'll see here that six and seven are actually complementary. What we're saying is, and I said this on the floor of, of the UN, you cannot have sustainable cities without having sustainable agriculture and rural prosperity. That's the history, you know, if you go back to, to Iraq as it was Mesopotamia at that point of time, because cities on their own are not able to actually create all these processes. They critically depend on ecosystem services, on peasant populations, et cetera, to manage the processes. So there's a symbiosis which is very critical, and we have to accept that. It's not keeping people in this place or the other place. They have, the, have to have the right in, a, in, in the current world of self-determination of where they would like to go, where they would like to stay, where their children would like to be educated, et cetera, et cetera. But these two have to come together, which means that this is actually a definition which is largely in our head. It's come, of course, from historical experience, but it may be necessary for us to re-examine it because we're now living in a world of nearly 9 billion people. These rules were made when the world was 1 or 2 billion people strong. We're now in a world that's full, that has lots of feedbacks. We may have to re-examine the rules that have been made in the past because they don't work for us. And I think great countries, great nations, great institutions are able to re-examine these questions and come back and, and look at them. So the MDGs, in a sense, didn't do justice to urban areas. <clears throat> And we saw the SDGs as, as, as an opportunity to establish a new governance architecture, addressing some of the questions that I talked about, the equity question, the question of global commons. And that was a big debate in the, the UN about whether we should have a climate goal or not. Is it going out into the COP or X, Y, and Z? And of course, hidden behind that, in the discussions about the global financial architecture and the financing of development is the real hidden question, and that is, how are we going to distribute, collect first, and then distribute our surpluses to enable all of this stuff to happen? Because it will require investment, whether it's human development, schools, or healthcare, or infrastructure, or a decarbonization of, of the entire system. So in some senses, there is a new debate there. There is a new engagement. It's not formalized. It's not there in the structures of power. But it's happening because it's real. Um, and I think we need to recognize that and open ourselves to that discussion. So in, in some senses, what we said was, yes, Urban transformation is possible. We've demonstrated this at, at, at local level. We know that it's necessary to enable at the global scale because that's what the global economy is going. That's where the bulk of our people are going to be. But it has a lot of attendant risks in it. So if you want to bring this together, it will be a very useful thing to have a globally directed goal which will enable us to bring these ideas together and at least tell us whether we're going in the right direction or whether we have to make a change. So in, a, in some senses, when we articulated this, basically what we said, as you know, the, the, the movements and, and, and the agencies working on, uh, on urban questions is that this is a 21st century idea. There, were, there are some of those goals that are actually 19th century ideas, things that are actually established that we have not delivered on. The end of extreme poverty is one of those. This is an old debate that goes back to the 1850s. We might be able to deliver it just now if we actually establish a new system that's more equ equitable within country and between countries. And I think there is a global compact on that. That's something that's agreed. There's no question about that. 
Whether multidimensional poverty will be addressed is another question. My own sense is if we do the, the right things at the right time, make the right investments, even that could be addressed. And then, of course, tied to that, uh, education, healthcare, et cetera. So these are traditional, what I would call early 20th century goals. The two new ones that have come up and are most contested because we can't get ahead around them very much. One, of course, is climate and global environmental change, where climate is a euphemism for that. And the second one is cities, because we've never really understand, we've never really understood how this scale of change can be managed. We don't have the governance systems to take, take that into account. We certainly don't have a multi-level framework uh, that works from, uh, from the global uh, system downwards. So essentially what we did was, because nobody believed us, when we started this, they said, you know, cities, what are cities? Why should cities have a goal? It's just a you know, silly idea that a few ha people have. So we basically, over a period of almost a year, brought together all the major urban institutions across the world. That was a very, very interesting task to build a common platform, and you can see them. And then what we said was, fair enough, bring the big institutions together, whether it's Habitat or C40 or ICLE or UCLG is not enough. The real players are the regional governments and the cities, because that's where the action happens. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the biggest challenges actually take place. So we mobilized across, uh, across the world around this to you know, take, tell the nation states, to tell the United Nations system that, look, there's something real happening there. There's a very important set of innovations here that you cannot neglect. And then we brought together you know, some of the, be the, the better research agencies. You can see them across the world who are helped support this, including you know, <coughs> uh, institutions like, like ourselves. And I think the most interesting turning point took place last year, when in January, we had the mayor of Rio, among many other mayors, and he wrote to the SG on this, and he basically said, we started this process in Rio. We affirmed it in Rio plus 20. But what you're forgetting is that cities and towns are the places where we can actually make the problem um, we can actually address these challenges and problems and turn the challenges into opportunities. And this is part, this is, I've, I've quoted from his letter there. He basically said that you cannot do this. You cannot affect the SDGs without having an urban goal, not because we want to bring everything into the urban. Obviously, you want to have education and healthcare and water and energy separately. But this is, this is the locus in which action and transformation actually happen. It's, it's very simple. Without place, without your home, without a place to work, without a real place to engage things, people really can't do anything. We don't only live in our heads in some senses. So we brought together about 200 cities and regional governments and pulled this off. And there was tremendous debate you know, as part of that process. And there was pushback. There was serious pushback on these five counts. The first count was a lot of countries, and you know, this is on, on YouTube, you can see it, this debate that went on for two and a half hours uh, in, in the UN. You know, countries were asking me, saying, you know, this is great, formulation is nice. But what's going to happen to us? You know, if you create an urban goal, what's going to happen to rural development? What ha what's going to happen to the funding that happens to agriculture? What's going to happen to drought? What's going to happen to famine? This is a bad way to deal with the world. And then we came back and said, look, at least the way that we look at it, these, are, these systems are not separated. They're complementary systems. We cannot divide the two together. We have to look at the continuum. And, and you know, that, that, that debate, which is a very, very reasoned and, you know, personally, you know, I, that was a tremendous opportunity for me to learn, uh, actually turned around. Literally in those few weeks in the open working group, people realized that this was an artificial division. It was a bureaucratic division. It comes from an earlier history, and we do not need to be captured by that. Obviously, in the long run, you're not going to, I mean, in the short run, you're not going to change how governments work. But the second thing, of course, people were saying, look, too many goals. One more urban goal means you have to have a rural goal. You know, just, just get, out of the, get out of our hair. It's very complicated. Of course, there was a simple thing there. This is, this is the fulcrum of a, a lot of where the world system actually plays out. If you don't have it there, then you might have real trouble in, in making the whole framework work. And then there were some countries who were saying, look, the most important thing for us is industrialization. For industrialization, you require infrastructure. Infrastructure is much more important to us than our cities. And we said, well, that's true. Infrastructure is very important. You cannot build cities without infrastructure. But there are other kinds of infrastructure, too. Infrastructure is not only used for industrialization, it's used for agriculture. If you don't have good irrigation systems in many parts of the world, you can't have food production. Uh, and of course, infrastructure is critical for services. We wouldn't be able to talk if we didn't have the internet infrastructure for us to do it. So that's also a narrow way of looking at things. You require infrastructure for everything. There's no use of trying to tie it down into a particular sector. It cuts across rural and urban areas. Transportation is a wonderful example. You can't really have adequate rural development and agricultural development unless you have transportation. But rural transportation and urban transportation are slightly different from each other, and we need to unbundle that. And then, of course, you know, there was a whole set of people saying, OK, urban is very good. It's fantastic. We should mainstream it. Uh, it cuts across everything. 
And of course, those of us who had some political sense said, well, that's a good idea and it's, it'll be nice. But we know that if we don't get the salience, we'll lose 15 years and the world cannot wait for that for those 15 years because if, if we do, and you know, a lot of Asian and cities go down the tubes and get into trouble, then we're all in trouble. Uh, whether it's on the climate side or on the economic development side or even in terms of social security, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, the big challenge, which is the key question that I'm trying to, you know, I'll, I'll open up for discussion here, is the idea of localization. The idea that nation states will determine what will happen in the world and there will be a common framework that applies to every nation states is what underpins this. But as soon as you get to the local, it often means that the challenges in Sao Paulo are very different from the ones in Cape Town, are very different from the ones in Singapore, are very different from the ones in Shenzhen, are very different from the ones in Delhi or Lucknow. So the question then is, in, in a system that's used to having you know, simplified solutions, how do you have the same indicators for everything? So that was a very interesting debate, saying that maybe you have to have two sets of things, some things that are universal and some things that are local. And we have to understand and accept that this form of plurality is very critical for us to deal with stuff. So the question that we said was, why do you use 19th century ideas to deal with this? And our response was very interesting. We basically took two cities, and this, you know, I laid out. And we said, okay, let's take this goal, and we will show you how in actual practice, the only way to do this stuff is go to, to go down to city level. So we took the one on extreme poverty, and th this is interesting. We plotted New York, and we plotted Bangalore next to each other. And that was a bit of a shock, you know, because in, in, in some senses, there's some things that New York, for example, I'll just skip a few slides here. This one is most obvious on air quality. Look at New York's situation as far as green cover is concerned. The only green that you have in Manhattan, unfortunately, is Central Park. Bangalore is a city of, of you know, of, of gardens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can find in different cities different kind of challenges across this sort of multidimensional engagement. If you're able to drill down to city level, you can actually find solutions. So, of course, you can have something that's globally comparative, et cetera, et cetera. And we've looked here at, you know, three or four different things. I'll just quickly take you through, let's say, something around um, about infrastructure. So this is an infrastructure thing. This looks at internet access. Uh, this line here is basically 1990. This is 2000. And you can see the massive build out of internet infrastructure in Bangalore. Because now, you know, most people have cell phones. We have high speed internet. And in some senses, you're catching up with New York. And that's, you know, so. When you start looking at this thing, you start unbundling it by different factors, it becomes much more concrete. You can actually look at it. You can actually operationalize something which can, can, can work uh, quite clearly. So that was our response. And of course, we had more debate. There were four more sessions. And at the end of it, we had you know, a set of 10 goals. This is what came out. So the good, good news, of course, was starting from nothing in the middle of 2013, we now suddenly had goal 11, which looked very much like what we wanted excepting for one small thing. The word productive actually dropped out of this. And for those of us who work with employment and stuff like that, that's probably the most important word. That could actually wrap into something else. But we're there. And hopefully, as the, the process plays itself out over the next year, uh, there'll be something that'll actually happening. So essentially, you know, as, as sort of a wrap up of that, the urban sustainable development goal is inspirational, aspirational, and operationalizable, especially around cities. Uh, it can bring together multiple sectors. It's not easy, we're not pretending that it's easy, but it'll require reimagination of the institutional and financial architecture for this process. And that, I think, is, is a real challenge to be able to bring things together. And of course, uh, you need the commitment of all these actors to enable the, the reframing of, government, of governance to make this possible. So uh, there are a few things that we may be missing. There are probably too many goals at the current point of time, at least that's my personal opinion. Uh, there are too many targets and indicators that confuses ordinary people tremendously. And if you want to help ordinary people, and many of us in government and in other things are fairly ordinary, you know, uh, it's probably best to have a smaller set. The second thing is that we've dropped out rural prosperity. And for me, that's a huge problem. I worked for 30 years on cities and rural areas. This is a problem. It needs to come back. The linkage between cities, productivity, employment, and poverty, po uh, poverty reduction has been broken. This needs to be reconnected. It does not work for us in the you know, in, in the cities of the south to deal with this. Uh, infrastructure as tied to industrialization is useful. Well, like I said earlier, what about village infrastructure? What about agricultural infrastructure? What about, you know, services? Cities are not only industrial. That's only a phase in development. The implementation architecture is, over, you know, overlapping and horribly confused. Uh, and how much resources and means of financing will be required to play is not in this discussion. 
And typically, you know, especially those of us who worked in public policy, if you have a separate discussion about financing and a separate discussion about implementation, you have some problems later. You need to bring that discussion together and at least you'll be able to pull back some of the bright ideas that you have that will not actually work. And finally, there's a very weak emphasis on legal, regulatory, and institutional capacity. And for cities, that's a huge challenge because we really don't know how to deal with it and we need to deal with it in tremendous scale in under 20 years' time. And that's why so many of our colleagues from ACC and other places are sort of working on that. And of course, the fundamental question is, there was a limited dialogue with the primary agents of change. The people who are really at the forefront are not in the room to have that discussion. And that's what we've been dealing with. I'm gonna skip a lot of slides. Um, I guess the key question for us is, how do we implement this uh, if the goal actually comes together? That's the core question that's there. And of course, I'm gonna skip this very quickly. We do know how to implement this. This is a very quick case, something that we've just done, a $100 billion investment plan for one of India's new states. And you know, we know how to play this through. You look at the employment structure, you look at how the economic output works itself out across the state, you look at the relationship between economic output and workforce, because the critical thing, of course, is jobs at the end of the day. Uh, you look at how it works out differentially across the state by sector. You go on then and look at the environment and what it, how that constrains itself. You look at infrastructure, thermal and hydro, the big issue, I think, at the moment in South Africa, in some cases, you look at oil and gas infrastructure, you look at the road and rail and, and other things. Basically, you, you, you can unpick it. When you work at a concrete square where real things are happening, you can unpick this and you can, you can deal with these questions in space because that's exactly where things actually happen. Um, and then you go on to look at risk. And at the end of it, and I won't show it to you just now, you come up with an investment plan, a plan for intervention. And of course, we know that a plan is never what you put down on paper. It's a process that has to be established. So the institutionalization of that process is really the critical thing that's there. The plan is just a piece of paper. How you implement it is, is, is fairly critical. And then something which I will just flash you through very quickly. Uh, anyway, there's lots of stuff that's there. And you know, this, this has been the last two days discussion in, in Pretoria. We had a conversation on, 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 um, uh, on, on video on this. And you know, in some senses, when I look at, at this, at the uh, I, I, IUDF, something that's just been cleared about a month ago, is that correct, by, by South African uh, cabinet. If you look at the questions that I was raising earlier, it's a slightly different way of organizing it, but you've touched on all the critical points. You've touched on questions of planning, you've touched on questions of mobility, you've touched on questions of housing, you've touched on questions of land management, you've got to touched on questions of infrastructure, and you've touched centrally on questions, obviously, of economic development and, and employment. So in some senses, as one sort of travels and works across the world, you're seeing this kind of process emerging not from one or two, and we did this for the IPCC in a very systematic manner, from hundreds of places. And those places, unfortunately, or fortunately, are not in national government. Because national government is important, but not necessarily engaged with the reality of what's happening, plus the space to be able to innovate is actually local, where you can fall on your face, you can make mistakes, you can step up and do something else. So this is a very interesting frame, because it touches on all these questions, it is within, I imagine, the South African schema of things. It addresses your development challenges. It is aligned to a national development challenge. So the question then is, how do you match this with a universal expectation that works at international level and the way the global system works? And I think that is a dialectical question that we're asking just now. We need the UN system. We need the global financial system to try and understand that there really has to be a conversation about this and we have to look at a new architecture. So again, all the elements are there, transportation, human settlements, planning, land use governance, et cetera. I'll sort of flash through it very quickly. So what I'm saying is, city scale, we know it works. We know it works in hundreds of places, not perfectly and not along all dimensions because cities are very complex. They're the most complex environments that we've created in all of history. It's not some space station or some great new you know, technology. It's cities that we've created. And frankly, we've crashed them more often than you know, we've actually run them uh, properly. We also know how to do that, or at least we're engaging with this question at national scale and at regional scale. So at regional scale, we not deal with it. We're engaging with those questions at national scale. We're also accepting that we need to have a multi-scalar engagement. This is a new architecture that was not conceived when the Western European nation state was conceived. This is a new set of problems. A new set of challenges will give us uh, you know, a new set of uh, challenges. So this is a difficult conversation because when we have it, or, you know, we've opened this up with you know, representative of, 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 of member states of the UN. They say, look, we guys will handle it. This is an intergovernmental discussion. This is some stuff that you guys should keep out of because you're sub-sovereign. But you know, it's, it's like the old idea of the divine right of kings. 
Yes, you may be sub-sovereign, but you're the only guys who are actually sorting out the stuff and organizing things and whatever it is. So we've, we've initiated a very interesting process, and you can see it here. And that is a political discussion, which actually happened in New York in, in, in September, just before the General Assembly, where we said, OK, we brought in the key permanent representatives, you know, the representatives of, of key countries, the ambassadors in the room. But we, as the key speakers, only gave the opportunity for mayors to speak. And remarkable, that is sort of, that's Eduardo Paez, who spoke about Rio and make the commitments to actually set up the first sustainable development plan for a large megacity in the world, saying, look, we set up Rio, we're going to run with this. And he's actually going, running with that. Uh, Anne Hidalgo, who is the mayor of Paris, who made a commitment to actually look at climate change in cities and lead a process that runs after the Paris COP. And uh, um, your famous, yeah, Taos, Taos there, you know. And Bill de Blasio, who made the commitment in this meeting, which was then reiterated in the climate summit the next day, that New York would make an 80% reduction in, 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 its, in its climate footprint. So what they were demonstrating there is that cities and local governments can stay ahead of the curve because they're smaller, they understand what's happening. But of course, and these are the big megacities, this is, I guess, a political statement. Uh, so these are rich, well-organized, and extremely well uh, sort of resourced in terms of human resources and capacity. The challenge is, what happens to the secondary cities, the places where the most significant opportunities for employment, for change, for development will take place. So this is the opening of the conversation that we started, saying there has to be a conversation between sovereign, sub-sovereign entities, between cities and regions and nation states. We cannot, we cannot, at least in my appreciation, implement the sustainable development goals with just a group of 200 or 193. The 200 plus 5,000 more, maybe starting with 500 large cities, is what you need to make this happen. This is too complex a problem. We have lots of things that we don't understand. And it's only by bringing in a much larger set of people that we can actually move forward in this process. So very interesting, the Lord Mayor of, of Copenhagen, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, and the Mayor of Shenzhen, meeting for the first time, uh, exchanging notes for the first time. So the interesting thing that we're seeing, actually, is a learning that's taking place very, very rapidly between cities across the world. And in some senses, and of course climate is one example, and we're finding that in, in, in other areas, this is something that can help us get ahead of the current governance challenges that, that, that we're dealing with. So where are we going? An eight-stage an eight stage process to mobilize, to convene, like we're seeing it, to negotiate, because eventually this is an, in, in, you know, it's an interstate process. Uh, it has to be set up by the, by, by the member states communicating and inspire, inspiring people that cities are the future. They have the risks and they have the opportunities si simultaneously. And of course, the critical thing is, you know, we don't know how to do this. We have to be honest about that. We have to experiment. And we have to have the space for experimenting. And what better way than to, to, uh, doing that is than letting it out to, to an urban system where you have, you know, tens or dozens or hundreds of cities who can try and do things and, and do stuff. And the Chinese have done this very well. And of course, we have to educate ourselves. And finally, this will not work unless we're able to implement this process. Theory is great. It's very important when we're making quick changes. It helps us underpin and understand processes. But the critical thing here is the implementation. If we're able to implement, we can make a dramatic difference because cities provide us the opportunity to make that big difference. And we're hoping that, you know, by the city direction of process, by bringing together all these constituents and trying to reframe the way that we've actually engaged in the debate, that some significant changes can take place over the next few years, and then accelerate from now till 2030, because that window of opportunity is honestly 20 or 30 years long, whether it is from the social or the political side, and certainly from the environmental side. Uh, why give up that opportunity? The world is full of people. It's a great opportunity to actually change the world. We have more people alive today than pretty much of all of history. A great cultural opportunity. And cities are the place that hopefully that's going to happen, but not in opposition to places that are villages, because that's, that's the culture that we're coming from, and that's a culture that we need to respect, and that's what's going to give us the resilience to build uh, a different and, uh, you know, a differently organized world. So thank you so much. Thank you for the patience. And I'm sure we will have lots of interesting responses and questions. Okay, let's start. Yeah, first of all.
of all, I'd like to First of all, I'd, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting and detailed presentation, very insightful. My name is Anthony Silverberg. I'm with the Zenzi Institute. Looking at all these figures, I, I still think, I don't understand why you have left out the main source of all these problems, which is the exploding population of the world. They say that by 2030, there'll be 9 billion people on Earth. This is itself unsustainable. Now, all these mega cities that you speak about are dysfunctional in themselves. Shanghai, Lag Lagos, Mexico City. Already we're getting all these stress points now, which is climate change and HIV and Ebola. The only country which has looked at this problem so far has been China with its one-child policy. That also isn't working. What is, what is the solution for the world to get a sustainable future? Because we cannot carry on the way we are. Thank you. Happy Kambuda from Project 90. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the lecture and the presentation. I would like to say that what came out of this is that, um, uh, I don't know how people take this, but the nation state as it was uh, is dead. And we have to actually reconcile the idea that we are in Cape Town. And I'll go smart further and say that you cannot identify, you cannot, you cannot identify the face of South Africa. You can identify the face of Cape Town because we see each other every day. The mayor, and I'll put it like that, um, would be the right person to actually negotiate at the table, yeah? because they know exactly what's happening as far as the local council should be there. So in, in, in going forward a little bit uh, so that I can finish, um, as much as you had the 200 mayors, I think you'd have all of the mayors there. I mean, you've got the resources to do that. And I don't think that oh, um, 9 billion, 7 billion people are the problem, it's the economic that we have, the economic system that we have, that is the problem. And I'll just, start, I'll just respond to the gentleman over there and say, maybe we should think about how much we're consuming ourselves. A lot of the people who are consumer are consuming so much more than the person who should be getting the average or the mean. Thanks. We have a number of uh, questions coming from the online audience. Uh, I'll just read them through. Some of them, I believe, were already answered, uh, and, you, and you choose um, actually which, which one to cover. Um, changing the everyday lives of our ordinary people is our work. What role towns and cities um, uh, should play, and how do we enable change? Is the urban transformation possible? These are kind of general questions. Now, um, the uh, um, new urban geographies are creating new histories. Uh, can open streets um, be part of a new global narrative? Um, how is local transformation linked to a global urban transition? Uh, then on the urban sustainable development goal, um, make cities and human settlements inclusive, as you said. What's the role of civil society? Um, then is the current kind of urbanization inevitable? And the uh, final one, I know it's a, it's a pile of questions. Um, what happens to secondary cities where most opportunity lies for jobs and development? Um, I guess I'll quickly respond to the internet questions first. Many of them are sort of, I've, I've dealt with the presentation. I'll pick up just two. Um, civil society is a very important role in this process, uh, especially as we, we, we sort of move to a more interconnected world. Um, in, in some senses, civil society is, is, is very much part of this new frame of governance, whether it's international civil society or you know, civil society organizations within, within, uh, within, within countries. And in cities, I would imagine, depending on what kind of political regime you have, uh, they're going to be very critical in enabling a, a whole range of changes and a lot of the stuff to happen, whether it's from building capacity to delivering services to actually engaging 
with poverty and vulnerability um, at one end or enabling you know simple technical changes so you know the, the state has its strength and its limitations uh, the private sector does things for you know a particular motive uh, and some things are difficult to cost and internalize into that frame so civil society i think is a very very important role to uh, to sort of play in that there's they're both theoretical and other positions there on secondary cities like i said just just recently uh, secondary cities are very critical to this process in fact some of the externalities that you are talking about uh, that come from very large agglomerations can be dealt with by much more networked uh, urban structures where you have a lot more secondary cities. Uh, and of course, what that does is that it spreads out uh, both development opportunities and employment opportunities across the landscape. So a whole range of regional development challenges start getting addressed as we develop secondary cities. And they're also much more tied to um, you know, the established cities don't come out by accident. They come up by a whole, through a whole range of processes uh, that take place, economic, social, etc. So secondary cities are, are quite important. The reason that you didn't see the mayors of secondary cities there was that we hadn't started actually opening the dialogue with them. But in the long run, as I said, you can't get to the 5,000. 5,000 was a notional, notional term in some senses, uh, till you get the secondary cities inside. Unfortunately, of course, in many countries that I know, uh, it would be very difficult for a mayor of a secondary city to go up and sit at the same table as a head of state and have a serious discussion. Uh, while some of these mayors uh, have, they deal with more power and more resources than a he many heads of state. So, you know, it's also a question of trying to, to open up a dialogue which, frankly, is a stratified dialogue that's around power and, and, and economic resources that you're, you're, you're dealing with. Um, in terms of a question of population, obviously, I mean, we know that this is something that's, you know, been a challenge for forever and ever. Um, even when some of us had worked on, you know, some of these global modeling things in the in the 80s and 90s, population obviously is a critical question. Uh, the issue, of course, for us now, is that we have seven and a half billion people, and a lot of the people who are going to be around for the rest of the century are alive, and both ethically and otherwise, I would tend to look at. Look at, look at our people as a tremendous resource. And the reason that we have, you know, a population explosion in many parts of the world is precisely because we have actually delayed the opportunity of providing adequate human development to a whole range of people. I mean, that's certainly true of my country. Um, whether it's healthcare or adequate education, especially for women, those are things that, that dramatically feed back into population systems. And people are not stupid, you know. They will have less children when it's it makes sense for them to have less children. Uh, and very often, we work from a remembered past which may not be true today. But if you're working with a country that had a high infant mortality, and you want some of your children to, to survive, and you need them as part of a whole economic system, then you tend to make certain choices. And of course, you know, in many places in the world, women don't necessarily have choices. So there are a whole range of complex questions there. But if you just look at that increment, we're talking about a billion and a half. It's a lot. That's, that's as many people as we had in, in 1900. But given the base that we have, I would err on the side of saying people are our most important resource. It is through the action of people and communities and processes that we can actually solve these challenges. But they have to be empowered institutionally through adequate education and given space to actually engage in these dialogues. So, you know, I would tend to look at it the other way around. And on the question of, of cities versus nation states, I'm, you know, I don't know how many political scientists there are in this room. I wouldn't actually. Um, I wouldn't write off the nation state that quickly, uh, even though it's a relatively new innovation. You know, the firm and, and the nation state are born about 500 years ago. So compared to cities and the great religions uh, and, you know, and major civilizational cultures, they're fairly young. But um, they're a very important part of how we deal with things. I mean, I don't, you know, it will be very difficult to just to deal with very practical questions. Um, we take an electric grid system. There's no way that you could take all the cities of a country and they would be able to build an electric grid system that could provide power to everybody. You do need an aggregation at a higher level. Uh, I think there's a much larger question, I didn't store the slides there, about how our future frame of governance will work. And we have fantastic experiments, uh, which have their own challenges, of course, like the European Union, where we are coming to engagements that are larger than individual nation states. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the experiment in Africa has been somewhat contested. But the idea that we move to a situation in which human unity is the central element of what we're talking about and not division based on ethnicity, language, or territory 
is something that we do need to consider. But I think that's part of what I didn't show you. There are six slides I didn't show you here at the end of this. Uh, those are questions about the paradigm. Uh, can, we, can we govern with another frame than the nation state? Uh, are our identities narrow enough that that becomes the only way that we can organize ourselves? And these are serious social science questions. And I think this is a, these are questions that each culture has to actually play itself out. Cities are important, but I don't think they're going to replace everything else. Uh, that would be uh, uh, somewhat foolhardy way of, of looking at things. This is an engagement between different types of institutions. We don't always have frameworks that en can enable them to talk to each other and actually work together. I think we're encouraging um, countries and cities to try and open those conversations and experiment on how these things will change. This thing will change over maybe, you know, your lifetime, if not mine. Uh, they take 30, 40, 50 years to change, if not longer. Uh, and technology will play a role in, in making that happen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you um, for your participation and attention this evening. Um, on behalf of the University of Cape Town and the African Center for Cities, I'd like to express our thanks um, and appreciation to Aroma Revi for being our inaugural Kapuczynski um, development lecture here at the University of Cape Town and for honoring, honoring us here in the city of Cape Town, making it the first African city to participate in this series. Um, we thank you very much for sharing your views on sustainable development goals and provoking us to think about how they intersect with processes of urbanization and how that might look in the context of cities of the global south in general and African cities in particular. Um, you posed some very provocative questions to us about how we might begin to manage the urban transition. Um, and I took away your emphasis on experimentation and transboundary learning. I think those are definitely two elements which we must, um, we must focus more on. And I'd like to also mention um, that <clears throat> for me, the most telling part of the talk which unfortunately we didn't get to focus on very much on, is the investment in human capital. Because that's actually how we're going to create citizens who can engage and create the cities of the future, which is what we all want. So thank you very much for traveling this very long way. Thanks also to the UNDP, the Kapuczynski Development Lecture Series, the European Commission, and our colleagues here at the university. Thank you very much. <laughs>